All right, welcome back to Ricketts Reef, uh, March 2020 update. So, uh, instead of doing one for livestock, one for the system, I'm going to combine them because this month they are closely interrelated. And so, might as well just go over them. It'll be pretty quick. The fish are all doing fine. Still have the fox face, the sail fin, the naso, the swallowtail angel, bicolor blenny, royal grandma, two cardinals, two clownfish and a uh, mandarin goby, a uh, green mandarin goby and a partridge in a pear tree. So that is what the livestock is in terms of fish and I guess snails and shrimp if you want to count that. Snails are cool because they've got like like an inch more shell than when I bought them. So they're they're getting big. I think they're the main uh, the main uptake of my calcium and alkalinity right now just building that shell. So that's kind of cool. Um, in terms of the corals, they are all doing okay now after I had stressed them out and that's why I'm kind of connecting the uh, system update and the tank at the same time is because I did a stress test on the tank in terms of I did not do any water changes for about a month and I stopped carbon dosing just to see how the tank would react to, you know, a, a, a less maintenance and uh it's a new tank so it it kind of did all right for a bit and then if you see on the back glass let's just get a little closer if you see on the back glass there is a nice healthy mat of brown hairy algae <laughs> so what happened was the first couple weeks the it started out at about 10 parts per million nitrates with my twice a day feeding I stopped doing the carbon dosing, I stopped doing the water changes, and I upped my feeding to four times a day, uh, which was just a lot, but I wanted to stress the system out and see how it reacted. It slowly rose over a week and a half to about 25 parts per million of nitrates, and then of course phosphates, which I don't have a test for, but I'm sure they, they increased too. And what I saw was at that point, the algae started growing on the back of the glass and so it kind of stabilized at about 25 parts per million because that algae became a nutrient sink. It started sucking it out of the system. Never really ended up on the rocks, which was kind of nice. Uh, it was all on the back glass and so that's that's fine. I will get rid of it. I could, it's easily, it's not on there hard so I could probably just suck it out but I'm just going to leave it for now as I drop the nitrates and get back to a normal regime and plus the sailfin absolutely loves eating it and so does the bicolor. Although the naso and the fox face I'm a little disappointed. They're, they're a bad influence on each other so they hang out and they're like man I don't want to do nothing I just want to eat prepared food. They're like they're like the bad teens right? They're just sitting at the back of the class not really putting much effort in. Pricks. So uh, <clears throat> which I have a, my own personal experience with, so that's why I can recognize the behavior. Ha! So anyway, anyway, back to the corals. So the uh, the corals are all doing fine, except for I did lose one acro frag, like a five dollar frag, in this experiment. Uh, not too concerned. It shredded after it hit probably twenty parts per million, and just RTN. So there's no saving it. And then at about a week sustained at 25 parts per million nitrates the uh, digis started showing some stress and actually the sailfin started showing some stress he was getting some light color so that's when I ended the experiment and realized you know the tank is is doing well but it's not mature enough to handle more than say like a month of no water changes so I kind of know where that's at and probably another six or seven months I'll do a little bit of a stress test probably not as much because I'll I'll probably have more livestock to consider uh, but this was very helpful in terms of learning the system dialing it in figuring some stuff out and uh, part of that was also the lighting so I had to work on the lighting too to see how the corals responded as the nutrients got higher because in a system like this in a reef aquarium your corals use basically three main sources to, to grow uh, nutrients to a degree and then there's a plateau and then there's a harmful amount uh, alkalinity to agree and then again there's a plateau and then there's a harmful amount and light and again to a degree there's a plateau and then there's a harmful amount the same thing goes for plants so if you uh, if you go to a greenhouse some greenhouses that are really concerned with growing things big fast quick uh, they will actually pump co2 into the greenhouse so our atmosphere you now 
my numbers are might be slightly off, but our atmosphere is somewhere around 4 to 450 parts per million of CO2. In greenhouses where they pump it in, they pump it in up to about 1300 parts per million. Uh, it starts kind of losing its its beneficial properties with plants at about 1500 parts per million and then it starts becoming dangerous, you know, up around 2000 parts per million. People can reasonably handle up to 3,000 parts per million. Like if you look at the ISS, the International Space Station, they're usually running about two to 3,000 parts per million of CO2 because you know they don't have trees or anything. They just have their scrubbers and whatnot. Uh, we as people start dying at like 6,000 parts per million, somewhere around there. So <clears throat> uh, there are certain levels of things that can be actually beneficial, which are sometimes thought as not and then uh, certain levels of things that after a certain degree when they usually are beneficial become harmful same with water like you can actually drink too much water and kill yourself you get you can drown by drinking too much water internally uh, so that's a thing so everything in, into like moderation into a certain degree and uh, it, it can be a benefit so that being said, my system for the most part runs a higher alkalinity because I'm using Red Sea Coral Pro uh, salt which comes with about a 9 to 10 dKH alkalinity and that's a high level, C is at about 7 so I run it a little higher and that encourages growth which is good for a new tank but eventually I will once I get colonies and all that stuff I'll probably slowly end up switching to uh, like a Red Sea Blue Bucket or, or maybe another salt like an Aquaforest or something like that uh, just because the I find the Red Sea mixes a little dirty. There's there's sometimes some extra precipitation, so maybe it's less with the blue bucket than the black bucket. So we'll see. Um, and then the nitrates being a little higher, just naturally because it's a new tank, it doesn't have sufficient enough filtration yet without really pumping in a bunch of carbon. Which, you know, it's okay to do that if you're very mindful, but it, getting the right amount of carbon isn't always easy especially while your tank is growing and maturing so maybe in about a year it'd be easier to dial in the carbon dosing but as the tank is maturing you're kind of always having to check it uh, I might actually get some bio pellets and and stick them in there because they're a little easier because they kind of work as your nitrates increase whereas dosing uh, which I'm currently doing it's a little it's a little more touch and go with testing and dosing and testing and dosing and testing and dosing so I may order some bio pellets we'll see oh there's the there's the mandarin oh there he goes <laughs> he'll be out he, he's he's out a lot now so pretty happy with the mandarin I've seen him eat mysis I've seen him eat my reef chili stuff so uh, he hunts a lot I, I add pods every other day to the tank the Tisby pods I've got them culturing in the in the fish room and then uh, he also eats eats prepared which is kind of cool he's still I don't know if he's fat I've never owned a mandarin he's I think he looks the same as he did when I got him so fingers crossed he survives he seems happy he's active so that's cool nobody picks on him and the sailfin the only one that was really a pain in the butt has stopped being a pain in the butt he just does his own thing he picks at the back glass and I think he's a little upset because the fox face who he used to pick on got bigger than him really quick and uh, he's, I think he's trying to outgrow him. I don't know if he ever will. I and mean, by the time he does, it doesn't matter because the naso is actually starting to be the assertive one in the tank and the naso will just put everyone in their place. Not in a, not in a harmful way. He'll just like, hey, I'm the biggest, I'm the boss. I, I'm front and center. I always tell the, the master when to feed me, which is all the time. That naso is a pig. So, so my little test ran to a point where uh, I was very close to all my digis dying. They hadn't had polyp extension for about a week and I, uh, I, I realized I had to do something so I did a 50% water change in the system and I started carbon dosing again. Since then the mat on the back has started to uh, disappear and I also did some tweaking of the nutrient export on the tank which I'll show you in a second. Uh, but the just kind of quickly back to what I was talking about in terms of the three things, alkalinity, nutrients, and light. So if you're running a high alkalinity system and you're running a high nutrient system, generally speaking, your lights need to be a little lower. Um, you, you can feed too much to your corals 
And same with a plant. So if you take a plant, you put it in a greenhouse, uh, back to that analogy because it's easy for most people to understand, and you put a bunch of fertilizer around its roots and you pump up the CO2 and you give it a lot of bright light, there's a good chance you're going to fry your plant. And it's the same thing for corals. You got to have a balance between two, th those three things, fertilizer, uh, air fertilizer, for lack of a better term, and uh, light, and then you can have a super fast growing, turbocharged growing plant, and the same thing goes for, um, for corals. If you want to learn more about that, there's a lot of talk out there about this. So one of the big guys in the, or a couple of the big guys that talk about this on a regular basis, one's Dana Riddle. So he talks about it. He did a talk that BRS put up about turbocharging. I think it's turbocharging photosynthesis is what the talk is called. Uh, Randy Holmes Farley over at Reef to Reef and Reef Central talks about this a lot. He's a, he's a chemist, super awesome guy. And... Uh, a couple of helpful people that put videos on YouTube about it. Besides BRS, BRS talks about it a lot uh, in their videos, but uh, Fish of Hex, I think that's his name, Fish of Hex, and he talks about it and so does, uh, a guy who's got some great videos, Coral Euphoria, Reef Euphoria, Coral Euphoria, something like that. He's got a 120 gallon uh, Acropora dominant tank and so he's just got a lot of good information and presents it really well. So if you want to look more into it, I suggest checking those guys' channels out and seeing what they have to say. I'm not going to reinvent the wheel here. They're, the information's out there. And I'm just following my or finding my sweet spot. And I also wanted to have raised alkalinity with my sweet spot because I want to, I want to push that growth. A little bit of extra nutrients, a little bit of extra alkalinity, some reasonable light, and then uh, hopefully I can get some good growth. And I've found that my nutrients where some people are pushing like 25, 30 parts per million of nitrates and stuff, that's too much for my tank. I, my tank has to dial in for the amount of rock I have, for the maturity level that it is, for the amount of refugium. I, I've got exporting nutrients, all that kind of stuff, skimmer. I have to keep my nitrates somewhere at about the 10, 10 to 15 range. That's my sweet spot for good coloration, good growth, and not a lot of algae. So. Test complete. The only thing left that I have to test is the lights. Now here's the problem with DIYing your own lights is unless you have a par meter, you're kind of guessing. You gotta, you gotta go old school and watch the corals and watch the polyps and see how they respond to different levels of light. Uh, I, I am planning hopefully maybe of buying one of those like Sensize because it's got a whole bunch of things. It's got par, uh, Kelvin, Lux, pH, temperature, and, and, and I think they're only 180 bucks, so I could build one of those, but by the time I'm done getting all the components, putting the time and effort, really it, it works out to be about the same. So it's a really good deal. And uh, the only other options are like getting a Neptune, which I don't need too much, and uh, getting, you know, with it, their own Apogee par meter or something like that. Again, too much and not as dynamic, so. Yeah, I'll see how uh, how quick I can get rid of this algae on the back glass. If it bothers me too much, I'll just suck it out with my next water change this coming weekend. And uh, with the whole COVID-19, I might have a lot of time to to spend on my tank because I might be I might be stuck home taking care of the kids, and my work might shut her down and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, reefers all over the world are like, eh, I get to spend more time on my tank. Hopefully, if I'm not sick. So, yeah. You know, best wishes for everybody getting through this. Keep your hands clean before you put them in your tank. No idea how this will react with your system. There's already evidence out there of cross species, so I don't know what it's going to do to fish. <laughs> so, uh, if you even see this, uh, apparently YouTube has me on a limited exposure algorithm. So, for all those people out there watching it, thanks for watching. Uh, because I get delisted after about a day. Uh, I'll, I'll pop up on the, if you do a search for like reef aquarium on YouTube under uh, say like upload date or something like that, where most new people will find your video is, is search by upload date. I get, de I get maybe one day exposure. It's part of YouTube's new algorithm right it's it's their AI like nobody programmed this right so I've I've either made some list somewhere because I've had too much to think and uh, I don't get very much exposure or uh, they're just blanketing this really 
unfair algorithm in the name of providing the best content to their viewers that they feel is appropriate, right? So it's basically just mind control <laughs> manipulation, right? That always worked, that, that, that has historically always worked out well. So keep going YouTube, see how well that works. You know, I think a couple months ago, there was already a, a hashtag trending called YouTube is dead. So there's a lot of other platforms popping up and you never know one day I might be forced to go to one of them like a lot of people are just because they're being tyrannical. They're being totalitarian. They're, this is the problem in the history when people try to keep people safe per se and think they're too stupid to do it themselves. They end up becoming the monster they say they're trying to save you from. So it's just history repeating itself. Here we go again. Hopefully it doesn't get too bad. But back to the tank, um, the lights. So I'm not gonna open up the canopy. So the lights, I still have the Kessel. I took it off the light mover. It worked to a degree, but I think it'd be something more for like a coral grow up. Uh, in a home aquarium where you wanna see and sit a nice pristine kind of pretty display and watch your corals and stuff like that. I found the light moving back and forth, even just in a small berth in the middle uh, was was distracting, much like the automatic zoom on this new camera, which I have to figure out. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, it wasn't working out too well. The panels I raised up to the very top of the canopy because they're producing a lot of light. And I was noticing the corals were just kind of like, meh, I didn't really like it too much. Look at that, look at that fat blenny. Look at his tummy, look. He's a lion on his tummy. That thing is so fat, he eats everything everything. He's the most voracious eater in my aquarium. He eats mice, he eats nori, he eats pellets, he eats flakes, he eats that back wall algae. You're so fat. I think I'm going to name you Godzilla. Hello Godzilla. Tubby. Tubby tubby. But he's pretty awesome. His colors are coming in too. Uh, so I was a little annoyed because his yellow really wasn't predominant. He could barely... Oh, where'd he go? <laughs> he knew we were looking at him. Uh, his yellow wasn't really really out there so uh, in the last couple weeks his, the yellow on the back of his tail has really really started to pop so loving that because I've seen a lot of bicolors that they're you know there was a really clear definition between their yellow tail and their black body and this one's more blended so I'm hoping there's going to be some more definition in the long run maybe it's a maturity thing like something like the uh, the grandma there there's there's a there's a definitive line between the yellow and the purple so under the system, the lights are, are tweaked a little bit. I've got the Kessel running 100% and I've got my panels. So I've got five blue bars running a maximum of 30%. I've got two 10K, 30K split bars running at 40% just because I like to see things a little less blue. Um, but it's still a nice kind of like, it's a nice shimmer, it's a nice shade. And I've got a 10k bar that's running at 30%. I've got a purple blue bar running at, I got two of those running at 20%. I've got a green bar running at 5% and a red bar running at 5%. So pretty low in terms of what my panels are pumping out, but until I get a par meter, I don't want to punch them too hard. And uh, eventually I'll, I'll maybe tweak it. And if I do, I'll be just acclimating slowly. So, big changes here. I moved the refugium from down there to up here. I got rid of that Chato sandwich I was testing out because it wasn't working. It was making the Chato grow in really bad ways and it was starting to have some die off spots and it was collecting a lot of detritus. I actually had to take it out and rinse it out pretty heavily uh, just because the, the way the detritus was just always getting stuck in it. So now I've gone back to the tumbling the tumbling ball with a pump down there and I've got this egg crate angled down so if the ball comes up and hits it it just kind of spins back around uh, I've got the light there I've got this little this little curtain here so the light doesn't get into the into the top of the system on the reverse photo period and it also doesn't grow algae on the overflow on the outlet from the refugium I've got the tubing that goes down to the Jabo dosing pump. Right now I'm just dosing calcium, or calc. Uh, I do have alkalinity and calcium, but I don't dose those. Those were just really to get my uh, levels up stable at the beginning. 
and because uh, it was low over the time I haven't been dosing and with the snails growing and coralline growing and all that kind of stuff it it was down to like 8.2 and I want to run at about 9 uh, and so I needed to dose some elk and then once I got a stable level in the tank then I'm running about 60 to 100 milliliters a day of fully saturated calc and ESV calc and uh, it seems to keep it at a stable level which is good that's what I'm looking for a stable level and then as things grow I'll just keep monitoring the elk and calcium and I'll up my dosages here and there and move from there but I don't really have that much coral so so there's not much I can really do like if you see there's some nice pulp extension on my corals this one's my big tail. This guy here, my forest fire digi. Sorry, new camera. I'm not really good at focusing with this thing yet. Uh, forest fire digi is my big tail. When his polyps go in, it's it's something's up. So that's the the new refugium spot. I like it much better. It's very easy to get at. Very easy to clean. I can keep the glass in the area that it that the chato tumbles clean with this thing. <laughs> So this is the most useless tool I have ever bought for an aquarium. I bought this back with my original 10 gallon on like the first month. This is old, this has been sitting around. And that scrubber pad, I never used it because it never really worked. It was kind of useless, a pain in the butt. But for this, it works. So I go in there every other day. I kind of go around the glass there and it keeps it clean enough that the algae, the, the tumbling ball, if it ever kind of contacts it or hits the bottom or the sides, it's not picking up any problem algae. Um, so it stays relatively clean. It doesn't get bogged down with film algae or hair algae or anything like that. And then the snails, I've got four snails in there, so they're always kind of helping out and stuff like that. But snails are slow. I'd have to have probably like 10 in there to make sure it keeps clean. I also put this, this on the back, this, uh, plastic cardboard stuff. I absolutely love this plastic cardboard stuff and that stops light spread from getting into the back and being a problem algae area in the back of the fuge there around the pump and then if you see the inlet uh, it's just a it's just a T one side goes in and then the other side I put a ball valve because in the future I might try a little a little algae scrubber on there or something like that we'll see we'll see a little little DIY algae scrubber so that might come when I turn this fuge into a frag tank. So this is this is going to be the frag tank eventually down the road, um, but obviously much further down the road because I don't even have colonies. Uh, because when I do get colonies, by the time I get colonies, I will probably replace the sump with a non-DIY ghetto sump. Uh, this is nice, like it's a. It's a 40 breeder. I put some baffles in it. It works. It's pretty good. I cleaned it out. I redid the silicone, all that kind of stuff to get it ready. And it works for the purpose that it is. But if I want to turn that into a frag tank, I want to move my chato down here somewhere, which means I'm going to have to make the sump bigger, which I have a lot of room. I have a lot of room to make that sump bigger. I can make it wider. I can make it. Oh, sorry, a little hiccup there because the camera ran out of space. I guess this. This old camera only has a certain amount of space. Anyway, back to where I was talking. Uh, the sump only has one purpose right now is really to stabilize the system uh, because I don't have a need for putting a refugium down here. You might notice I don't have a roller mat. So I took off my DIY roller mat. I didn't like it. I have come to realize, as I did with my first tank, I don't like touching pre-filter fish food and poo cake floss media. It's disgusting. It's nasty. It even I don't like washing it. Like the, the, the roller mat stuff was easy. I, I could just take it off. Barely ever had to touch it. Throw it in the washing machine with a cap of bleach. Clean. Roll it back up. Put it back on. Got it going again. Still don't like it. <laughs> and I came to realize I don't need it. Here And here's the reason. So hear me out. So Every five to seven days, the roller mat need to be turned. So that means five to seven days, the detritus was stuck in the mat in the water column. The same thing with the socks. The socks were in there for about seven to 14 days with all the detritus and crap in it in the water column until I took it out and changed it for a fresh one. 
Now this system, this setup, the water comes down here, it hits this, it hits this baffle and then all the detritus builds up in that kind of back part because there's not a lot of flow there. And then down that little hole there, you see that little hole? That's where the water actually comes out. It hits the skimmer first off, which I have dialed in to be a little more wet than usual, just to, to make up for the fact that I took the pre-filter off. And uh, whatever escapes kind of gets into here a little bit. And then I've got a lot of pods and some bristle worms in this area, in this bin. And that kind of cleans up stuff. And then it goes into this area. Now every f every seven days I do a bit of a water change, usually about 5-10% at the very least, depends how tired I am, sometimes I'll even do a 25% just because I feel like doing a little extra and it really takes not much time between a 10% to 25% but I always start with vacuuming out the, the sump. Every time, I'm a, I am a stickler for a clean sump. I don't like seeing my sump really all that dirty. I don't clean the glass sides or anything, but the bottom, I always get in there with my stick and hose and just... <laughs> it doesn't take long, a few seconds. I, I, I clean the sump more than I clean the display. <laughs> that, that's telling you, I think it's really weird. Uh, but I don't, I don't know, that's just me. I like to have it, and this way it's open. I can see everything nice and clean and I can get to my equipment and so the water comes in there, the detritus stays in there, goes to the next chamber, comes out the skimmer, past the heaters, goes past this NO3 brick and uh, re really sorry for the zooming here and then it goes into this final chamber and back up into the system and that pump pumps water up to the fuge as well as the display up there. So yeah, the only thing left to kind of fix on the sump is that useless Y on the return because the two pump thing didn't work but I'll probably just leave that until I uh, build a new sump. I don't know how I'll build one, but it's probably a year, maybe two off. So, in no rush. So here we are. Everything's moving along. I am now at the part where I can probably start thinking about getting some, some new corals. Uh, because I think I have dialed in the system enough to start adding some more stuff. Once I get rid of this algae mat on the back, that's when I'll be like, yeah, time to get some corals and uh, pray that they survive and grow into nice, large, happy colonies. The other thing is, you know, money. It costs money to buy corals and local fish shops don't sell anything at a reasonable price and, you know, it's not always easy to find people these days in my area, local reefers, and uh, so I might have to drive to the States and see what I can pick up down there if they allow me across the border. Apparently that's a thing now too. Was, uh, my aunt tried to go down the other day and she was getting some troubles at the border crossing just because of the whole the whole virus stuff. So we'll see, we'll see. No rush. Time to get everything healthy and clean in the tank and outside and then once everything's settled down it'll be time to move over to a new buying experience of getting some corals and some frags. And I might also want to build a, uh, a frag quarantine. I've seen a lot of people doing that these days and it's probably a good idea. Uh, with my last tank I did have one small problem with red bugs that I cleaned up with Interceptor but you know that's that's your tank taking a hit. I'd rather not do that. So, Comments, questions, feel free and uh, ooh, let me just quickly show you this. This is cool. So if you ever seen those feeding mats that you can buy online for like 10 bucks. You can just take a piece of this fabric sewing stuff, fold it in half, and cut some big holes out of it. And then if you use one of these, these clips, you can just clip it onto that, put it on your glass, and you can stick mysis and stuff in there. And it slowly thaws and goes into your tank. And it's pretty good. It works pretty well. You don't have to sit there and wait for something to thaw. You just stick it in the little basket, clip it on the thing, and throw it into your tank. And on that note, just quickly show you the fish room. Hasn't changed much. Water change area is still the same, pretty much. This area is all the same. And these are all some of my Tisby pods. And these are some more Tisby pods. There's the way Tisby's work is weird. They have like a, a boom bust cycle, so they'll work, they'll they'll fill up a jar pretty quick for well sorry, they'll fill up a jar in about two weeks. 
And then if you don't harvest them and keep the water clean, all that kind of stuff, and feed them properly, then they'll crash. And then next thing you know, you're like, oh, geez, I don't have very, very many pods in there. Uh, so this way, with all these jars with pods and stuff like that, I find half of them are in a boom and half of them are in a bust no matter what I do. So I've always got a good amount of pods. I can always put a whole bunch of pods every couple of days, uh, which is great for the mandarin. I've got these jars here I got at the dollar store. These things were three bucks each. They've got a spigot, they're glass, and they've got a plastic lid. And uh, I'll probably, I'm looking to culture some phyto. Now, I know this is a bit of a hot topic. I have a challenge getting the Gilliards F2 fertilizer where I am. It's bit, I don't know, you just can't buy it in Canada. I don't know if it's against our our government's rules, you know, all their rules and regulations these days in this free land we call Canada. Uh, but uh, all I could find was miracle Grow, so I might use uh, Melev's recipe. And it seems to work for some people. I'm really only growing the phyto, phyto to feed the pods. Then I take the pods and I strain them and I put them in the tank. So I'm not going to be getting too much in there. And even the F2 has some copper, that's the concern, is there's some copper. Now let me get away from that fan and yeah so so there it is March 2020 system is getting very stable very very stable very soon as long as we don't have any major equipment failure uh, and I can dial in those nitrates and get rid of that that algae I'll try naturally if not I'll I'll just suck it out when I get down to about five parts per million nitrates and then I'll be getting some some frags. Alright, later.